So now we're starting a new unit, Unit 5, Molecular Biology. Today we're doing DNA replication, and Wednesday and Friday we'll do transcription and translation. So DNA replication. I wanted to point out that I assigned two figures. I really want you guys to look at the figures and make sure you understand them. A lot of people learn visually, and if you have an image of that figure in your head, it may help you solve problems that you wouldn't remember just from doing the reading. So do look at these figures. This is a slide just for your information. You covered a lot of these structural features earlier with Dr. O'Dowd. I compiled these from Wikipedia for you. Remember that ribose has a hydroxyl on the number two carbon, whereas deoxyribose, that's in DNA, does not. ATP has a ribose sugar, and so the adenosine that's in DNA is different than ATP, because it does not have that hydroxyl. We're going to go through the first few slides relatively quickly because it's largely in review. When you <clears throat> were talking about uh, polymers, or polymers, you learned that DNA is a polymer of nucleotides, and there's a backbone here made up of covalent phosphodiester bonds that are shown by these yellow circles, and that's old news to you guys. But what I want to focus on today is that DNA has polarity. That means it has directionality. The ends are not the same. There is a five prime end and a three prime end. So it doesn't look the same in both directions. It has polarity. Now this is a special lecture for me because it's the only time in cell biology when I can say the word always and not be lying to you. I can say that DNA is always polymerized five prime to three prime. So this is an eternal truth of cell biology. So it's one that you need to memorize. You absolutely positively need to know that DNA is polymerized five prime to three prime. So the new nucleotides will be added down here at the three prime end. Polymerized five to three in this direction. And this is such an important fact that when you guys go to sleep at night, I want your subconscious to paint on the back of your eyelids five prime to three prime. Okay, make sure you remember this. Very important. This is some more review. We have purines and pyrimidine nucleotides. If you are having problems remembering this, I'm going to tell you the trick that I was taught when I was an undergraduate. That's the pyrimidines include King Tut and Cleopatra, who lived in Egypt, where the pyramids are. And I told you that I went to UC Davis, and our mascot was the Aggie, whatever an Aggie is. And they told us that Aggie and Guani, the ag, ags were pure of heart. So, so you can remember whichever one you like, but it will help you remember the converse. So the purines pair with the pyrimidines, A with T and G with C. It takes more energy to break which kind of pairing, A and T or G and C? G and C, that's right, because it has three hydrogen bonds. And we're not going to go through PCR, but it will be important to know in your future. So when Dr. O'Dowd did you a garage demo with DNA, she had two pieces of Velcro that she was using to represent DNA. And that's a very good parallel, because the two strands of DNA are held together with non-covalent bonds that can be disassembled and reassembled. This is a scanning electron micrograph of Velcro. If you didn't know what it looks like up close. It's made up of a bunch of little tiny plastic hooks that hold the two pieces together. Now, each individual hook is not very strong, but a lot of weak bonds together are strong, like this young man happily in his Velcro suit on the Velcro wall can tell you. Together, many weak bonds are strong. It's very important that these bonds can be broken and reassembled, because sometimes Velcro is better than glue. So this guy has his sandals on, and they were put on a position with the Velcro. If they were glued on his feet, he could never take them off. That would be undesirable. It's the same thing with DNA, right? You want it to be together, but you also need to be able to open it so that you can copy it to do DNA replication or transcription, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. So the fact that those are hydrogen bonds and not covalent bonds is critical for the functionality of DNA. I don't think we went over this, or Dr. O'Dowd went over this, that double-stranded, this is DS, this is double-stranded here, DNA is anti-parallel. 
The two strands are in opposite orientations, and you already knew they were connected by hydrogen bonds, but they're in opposite, 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 opposite orientations. So the five prime end of one is opposite the five prime end of the other, same with the three prime end. So the two strands run in opposite directions. Because we have our always here, DNA is always replicated five prime to three prime. The strands have to be replicated in opposite directions because each one is replicated five to three. So the next nucleotide would be added here, the next nucleotide would be added here, opposite ends. I'm not going to show this video about the structure of DNA, it's like a slide review, but it's a very nice one. And if pictures help you think, I strongly recommend you look at it on your own time. Instead, I'm going to show you an animation from your text. In principle, copying DNA, a process called DNA replication, is very simple. The two complementary DNA strands separate, and because each nucleotide can only pair with its complement, adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine, each strand can be used as a template to build a new complementary strand, producing two DNA molecules. In the cell, DNA replication is a little more complicated, but the principle is the same. For clarity, we have untwisted the double helix. Remember that each DNA strand has a 3' prime and 5' prime end, and the strands run in opposite directions. DNA replication begins at specific sites called origins of replication. Proteins attach here and separate the DNA strands, forming replication bubbles which grow in both directions. Enzymes called DNA polymerases move along the template DNA strands and catalyze the elongation of new strands. Because DNA polymerases can only assemble new DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, only half of the new DNA can be synthesized in one continuous piece. The other half is synthesized in short pieces. As the replication bubbles grow, one daughter strand is synthesized continuously, while the other daughter strand is synthesized in pieces. The pieces are joined together by the enzyme DNA ligase. Eventually, all the replication bubbles merge, yielding two identical DNA molecules. Okay, so that was a little bit oversimplified, but a nice overview. Now we're going to go through some more details. The origin of replication here, where the two strands are pulled apart, is in the center of the replication bubble. So right here in the middle. A lot of times people get confused about that. The origin is where the strands were first pulled apart. In mammals like us, so we have six billion base pairs of DNA to copy each time our cells divide. That's a lot of DNA. So you need to have multiple origins of replication in order to be able to copy all that DNA and divide in a timely manner. So the origin was here in the middle. The replication fork is here. That's where the two strands are coming apart. The fork is the branch. So you can see here, this is a real piece of DNA. The origin would be in the middle here where the bubble first opened up. And then there's two forks. This one is opening up in this direction. And this one is opening up in this direction. And you can, in fact, see another origin and another origin, all in the same piece of DNA. So multiple origins. Now we're going to zoom in on the replication fork. So this is just one side. The origin would be over here. And there'd be another fork opening in that direction. We're going to go through these enzymes here that weren't mentioned in that overview video I just saw, but all of these guys are required for DNA polymerase to be able to jump on and do its job. So the first one here is helicase. Helicase breaks hydrogen bonds, and it unzips the DNA. So it pulls the two pieces of Velcro apart. Now you know if you pull two pieces of Velcro apart, particularly if they're long, what happens is they stick back together again. The two strands are complementary, so they could just close back up in base pair. But we have these single strand binding proteins that prevent the complementary strands from remealing. So they keep the replication fork open. Now another guy over here, topoisomerase, and 
what this does is relieve the torsional stress ahead of the replication fork. And in a few minutes, I'll do a demonstration for you that hopefully will help you understand what torsional stress is. But I want you to notice here that topo isomerase has broken the backbone of DNA. So it can break phosphodiester bonds. Over here, we have another enzyme, primase. DNA polymerase can't start from scratch. So it, to add a nucleotide, there has to be a 3' hydroxyl there for it to stick the nucleotide to. RNA polymerase can start from scratch. As you'll see on Wednesday, it has to for transcription. So RNA polymerase can add a nucleotide without bonding it to anything else. And so it makes this first primer here made out of RNA. So primase is an RNA polymerase. It's just called primase because it primes DNA synthesis. So there is the RNA primer. Prime is a word from the English language that's just applied here in science. What it's doing is it's making a primer. It's making something ready for DNA polymerase to come in and add DNA nucleotides. So that's where the term primase comes from. All right, so let's try the demo. So on here, I have a piece of yarn that's representing the double helix of DNA, and it's taped down here. And that tape wouldn't be there for the nucleus of the cell, but there'd be a whole lot of DNA there. And that DNA would anchor the other end of the yarn. So that's why the end isn't moving around, because there's a whole bunch of DNA over there holding it in place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to helicase, and I'm going to pull the two strands apart. So what kind of bonds am I breaking? Hydrogen bonds. And as I pull, you'll see that the twist ahead of the fork is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And now I'm pulling really hard, and I can't go any further. Because there's so much torsional stress ahead of the replication fork that DNA synthesis would stop. What topo isomerase does is it cuts that strand, lets them untwist, and then puts them back together. So that's what the torsional stress is. So now I have a quicker question for you to see if that made sense. During DNA replication, topo isomerase breaks, hydrogen bonds, phosphodiester bonds, or the covalent bonds between the antiparallel strands. Energy phosphates. You enzymes, can you put on your slides? 
Doesn't matter who is who. Okay, we have four enzymes that are going to help us with our replication problem. Oh, three enzymes and one very important molecule, ATP. So ATP, you also get some high energy phosphates. Okay, so who do we want from our enzyme pool here? Who do we want to use first? Who's going to start DNA replication? Here, you guys turn so they can see your signs. Who's it going to be? Primase, right? To start, to get ready. It's going to be primase. Primase, come on out. We're going to start with this A right here. This A is where we're going to start. So go pick a nucleotide. Red is RNA and blue is DNA. So pick one and bring them over. Okay. Now your job is to line up this A. Okay, that's good. But is he facing the right way? <laughs> Oh, they're still facing the wrong way. Straight mouth. Anti-parallel. Yeah, okay, that's good. Well done. Well done. So we have anti-parallel, so it's five prime side. It's facing the three prime over here. How does he attach that A? Hydrogen bonds. Very good, yes. And is there anybody he was attached to? Did he have to lose his phosphates? No, the RNA primase can start from scratch. So you can go get yourself another RNA. Now you have to tell me where this, this RNA nucleotide goes. Mm, what do you guys think? Mm, DNA is always polymerized. Five prime to three prime. So the next nucleotide is added where? Yep, 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 very good. Okay, so now you're gonna need your phosphates handy. All right, so you can step up here. Now where's the energy come from to form this phosphodiester bond? Okay, so you're gonna drop how many of those high energy phosphates? One, two, drop two. No, you can drop it. They're supposed to bounce. See? They're high energy phosphates. Okay. So we lost power phosphate, and that other phosphate goes where? It gets involved in a phosphodiester bond. Yeah, you have to do that. That's right. Okay, very good. So primates, you get a break now. Thank you for your hard work. Primates would add a few RNA nucleotides, and then our friend DNA polymerase would come in and take over. So go polymerize the DNA nucleotide for me. Now uh, you've got it easy. Where are you going to put him? Not there. Yeah, that's it. He's going. Okay. Get in position. Come on. Put him in the right place. All right. So now, where's the energy coming from to drop your, your bond? You can drop the power phosphate. Good. Okay, form your bond. Go get another one. 100 nucleotides a second. You got to be fast. That's how fast it goes. It's pretty impressive. Are you bonded? Yes, good. Okay. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We have, we have no bonds. Make sure she does it right. Drop them. Okay, bond. Is your phosphate there? You gotta have the phosphate there. You have the third, yes, so that's involved in the phosphodiester bond. Very good. Okay, this is the last DNA nucleotide, and then you get a break. Okay, do the right thing. That one has to be in the bond. No, no, no. Put that in your phosphodiester bond. There you go. Okay, so now, are we done? What's wrong? Well, there's two over there, so you know something else. There's only one. There's only one. Okay, so what's wrong? Is this a correctly replicated piece of DNA? No, right? What do we need to do? Boot the RNA, right? So who's going to do that? We have a DNA polymerase that does that job. So DNA polymerase, go ahead, replace this RNA with DNA. Yep, rip him out. See ya. <laughs> okay, now you don't have any energy. You only have a single phosphate. 
really good. Drop your arm. Okay, and you go. Okay. Next, there would be a DNA nucleotide in front of her that she'd be bonding to. We don't have that many people. Next. Okay, see ya. All right. Well done. Form your phosphodiester bond. Got to use the phosphate. There you go. Okay, so now there's no phosphodiester bond here, right? Because how many are you holding? <laughs> So he can't form that phosphodiester bond. So who do we need? Ligase. Well done. Okay. Ligase, where are you going to get the energy to make that phosphodiester bond? ATP. Drag it over. Okay. How many phosphates is she going to drop? Two. Well done. Okay. So now you can make the phosphodiester bond. Very nice. Did you drop it again? <laughs> okay, so they've done a very nice job. Let's thank them and good work. You guys can go on and get your um, reward. Take up the costume and get your reward. And while they're getting cleaned up, you guys can look at this list of some of the things that I want you to remember from that demonstration. Yeah, take the candy from this bag. Okay, so the first thing you saw was that we started with RNA. DNA polymerase cannot start from scratch, but RNA polymerase can. So that first nucleotide is soon positioned by an RNA polymerase that we also call primase. The energy for forming a phosphodiester bonds came from that triphosphate. Did you get it? Did you get candy? Okay. All right. So. The energy came from the high energy phosphate bonds on the nucleotides themselves. We extended this RNA primer with DNA. We then had to get rid of it though, because we're making DNA. We don't want a DNA RNA hybrid. So there's another DNA polymerase that comes and takes the RNA primer out and replaces it with DNA. We needed ligase plus ATP to form that last phosphodiester bond where the DNA was replacing the RNA, because that RNA had already used up its energy being involved in the phosphodiester bond. Actually, the nucleotide behind it. So that's why you need ligase. So one of the main points I want you to get from this is, which way should they face? So DNA polymerization is five to three, and why on earth do we need ligase? Because that baffles a lot of people. So ligase, it, okay, so, Everybody with science, we're going to change the slide. But you guys can go to the website, right above where I put the lectures, there's a link to the podcast. If you click on that, you will go to the podcast. Then you can turn my voice off if you want and go through all the slides at high speed by sliding a little bar on the, the bottom. And you will see exactly what I put up there. It will take you minutes. Or you can watch the videos that they're recording in this section. But you know, it will be very easy to get this information. Ligase forms phosphodiester bonds between nucleotides that no longer have high energy phosphates. And this term ligase is another word from the English language. So to ligate something is to tie a bond with a ligature. A ligature is a medical term, it means a thread or a wire that you tie something around. But here, our ligase is linking, bonding, or tying two nucleotides together. Okay? I put this in this morning, that's why you don't have that. But you can look it up in a free online dictionary if you want. So I would like you guys to look at figure 16-7 very carefully in your book. This video does a nice job of going through the points in that figure. Hopefully it will work. Okay. DNA replication begins when helicase unwinds a segment of the DNA and breaks the hydrogen bonds between the two complementary strands of DNA. DNA polymerase can only add new nucleotides to a free 3' end of a growing chain. Synthesis of one strand of the DNA, called the leading strand, 
proceeds continuously in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Synthesis of the complementary strain, called the lagging strain, is more complex. DNA polymerase can add new deoxyribonucleotides only to a free 3' prime OH. To provide a free 3' prime OH starting point on the lagging strain, RNA primase attaches to the DNA and synthesizes a short RNA primer. DNA polymerase 3 then adds deoxyribonucleotides to the 3' prime end of the RNA primer. DNA polymerase 1 replaces DNA polymerase 3, removes the RNA, and replaces it with DNA. Finally, the enzyme DNA ligase forms a phosphodiester bond between the 3' prime OH of the growing strain and the 5' prime phosphate in front of it. During DNA replication, the leading strand is synthesized continuously, while the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously. Okay, so there's a lot of information packed in that video. You can look at the figure in your book, it should let you the main things I want you to remember are the things that we went over after the demonstration, but sometimes seeing this in motion is helpful. Now this is a replication fork that I drew myself, which is why it doesn't look very professional, but I wanted to draw it myself for a reason. So here is the origin, remember it's in the middle of the bubble, it's where the two strands got pulled apart, and now there's two replication forks. One is opening up in this direction, and one is opening up in this direction. Because the two strands are anti-parallel, only one side of the fork can be replicated in the same direction that the fork is opening. So as this is opening up in this direction, this strand can be synthesized continuously because it's being made five to three in the same direction that the fork is moving. This strand up here has to be synthesized discontinuously because you have to make a primer back here and backfill as the strand opens. So the leading strand is called the leading strand because it gets the closest to the fork. And it can do that because it's being replicated in the same direction the fork is moving. On the other side of the origin, these flip. So now the leading strand is on the top because it's being polymerized in the same direction that this fork is opening. Now the first time I drew this, I had a very hard time. It's not an easy thing to do. So I would recommend that you guys try drawing your own fork and then checking your answer with this or a picture in the book. Because I think if you can do it, you thoroughly understand the process. And if you don't, you'll at least know what you don't understand, which is a step in the right direction. So draw your own fork. Now I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about some issues from the LBL. I thought this was a really cool factoid we were learning about chromatin packing. So if the DNA elements comprising a single human cell were written in 12-point type, the letter string would stretch from Sydney, Australia to New York. So that's a lot of compaction to get that much DNA into one teeny tiny nucleus. So chromatin does a good job. And one of the questions I want to address is why do you need so many histones? I can't remember for sure, but I think it says in your book that it's about 200 base pairs of DNA per histone. So 145 or so is wrapped around the histones, and then there's about 50, 55 in between the histones. Now, when we humans have a long piece of something that we want to keep organized and not get tangled, we do something like this. We put it on a spool. This could be a spool of thread or a hose. Mine was just look like this, but I wish it did. This is a cassette tape something that I had to use when I was in high school to store my music, it was very frustrating. If you wanted to listen to the song that was here, you had to rewind or fast forward or flip it over, very irritating. And so that's why we have so many histones, because only 200 base pairs of DNA are wrapped around each nucleosome, it's easy to access them. You don't have to unwind thousands or hundreds of thousands of base pairs to get into genes. It's only 200. So that means accessing the DNA is more like using an iPod. You can go right to where you want, take the histones off in that region. You don't have to unwind a whole bunch of stuff. I, I should put this image in your LBL and ask you guys to tell me what it taught you about the nucleus. The first time I saw this picture, it made me think about the interphase nucleus a lot differently. These are some of your comments. The homologous chromosomes represented by the same colors are not together, but are in different parts of the nucleus. 
So that's important, right? The homologous chromosomes don't need to be next to each other in an interphase nucleus because the relative position doesn't really matter. They're not, they don't need to pair up or anything, so that's fine. Each chromosome occupies its own territory. It's not simply a soup of randomly scattered DNA as it might appear. It's not a big plate of spaghetti. Each chromosome has its own territory, its own area of operation. So they're not all mixed up. They have a shifted space. And they don't look like chromatids either, right? They're not completely condensed. They're in a more open form that allows some transcription. OK, so I have two things that we need to address here. A given gene, because we had some problems with this. So you want to you listen here. A given gene may be found in euchromatin in one cell type and heterochromatin in another. So euchromatin is open, more decondensed and active DNA. Heterochromatin is the more condensed. So go ahead and give me your answer. Click it if you haven't. Okay, this is pretty similar to the answers I saw in your, in your LBL. So most of you got this right, but there's a significant portion of you that are still confused about this. So the answer is true. DNA compaction is a really critical way in which gene expression is regulated. So in a liver cell, there are going to be genes like for rhodopsin, a protein in the eye, or a muscle-specific myosin that the liver cell won't need. So the liver cell will compact that DNA really tightly. It won't be expressed. It'll be heterochromatin. But in the lens, maybe, or the retina, where you need to make a lot of rhodopsin, then that gene will be open. It will be a euchromatin because the retina makes rhodopsin. So the differences in chromatin structure help make cell types different. So this is absolutely true. Confusion or we're good now? Good? OK. Now this one is the second problem. So changes in the availability of glucose could affect whether a gene is found in euchromatin or hydrochromatin. True or false? OK, go ahead and click in. Same question you saw before in your homework. And this is the way you guys answered on your homework. But this time, most people got it wrong. So the minority is correct. It is true. OK, this is really important. Environmental changes, changes in how the cell is working affect chromatin state. It's a key level of regulation. So I said glucose, but this could have been pH, it could have been temperature, it could have been a virus, it could have been a hormone. Anything that changes gene expression could easily change the state of the chromatin. Are there any questions about this? OK. So I want to remind you guys to vote. Prop 30 matters to you, so read about it. It will affect your tuition, so you should read it. And prepare for lecture on Wednesday. I finished early. I'll see you guys at office hours at 2 o'clock if you want to.